Hello, everybody. How are we doing today? My name is Justin Williams. I am the Development Director at Humanity Forward. Welcome to Wood Basic Income Raise Prices. Um, this session is brought to you by, uh, with the generous support of our sponsors, uh, the Gerald Huff Fund for Humanity, uh, Humanity Forward Foundation, Aid Kit, and Steady. Um, before we begin, um, I would like to give a brief overview just on how to use Crowdcast. Um, if you'd like to submit a question to the speakers, please post in, a ask, in the Ask Questions section that is below. Um, you may also vote on questions already posted by other attendees. This will help us focus on questions the group is most interested in. Um, next, there is a chat box where you can hold side conversations. This is where you can post any kind of like supplemental information, links, those sorts of things. Um, in order to keep things moving, we do not intend to respond to any activity in the chat. Um, so please be sure to submit any questions into the Ask Questions section. Um, would like to introduce our panelists for today. Um, we have Yona. I'm sorry, am I saying that correctly? Yoana. Yoana, thank you. Um, and Yoana, please say your last name as well. I want to make sure. Marinesco. Marinesco, great. Um, Yoana is an associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania and a research associate at the Natural Bureau, Bureau of Economic Research. Um, she is also the host of Just Economics podcast. Um, we also have Claudia Sam, who is the founder at Stay at Home Macro Consulting and former Federal Reserve economist. Um, if you would like to elaborate on your backgrounds, please be sure to do so. Um, I know that you all can speak much better to yourselves than I can. Um, it's something that I try to do very often as well. Um, so without further ado, I think we can start to get into it. We have about 45 minutes and wanna make sure that you know we have time to answer questions and that also our panelists have time to answer the questions in general. So I think let's just get underway. All right, so let's start with uh, I will go from left to right. So, Joanna, uh, this question will start with you. Um, how much of the connection between basic income and inflation results from deficits compared to other factors? Um, so, you know, uh, there are many um, aspects to this question, but broadly speaking, you would expect any basic income that is fully financed, meaning that there is no increase in the deficit to have zero, essentially zero effect on, on prices because there is no additional circulation of money in the economy and therefore there is no you know, big reason to expect any uh, increase in, in prices. Great, Claudia, would you like me to repeat the question or? Yeah, no, I mean, I this was well said, right? <laughs> um, and there are, there are very straightforward um, equity ways to do the, if you think, I mean, it is a, a separate question as to how important deficit spending is for this, in particular because basic income or, you know, um, I've done a lot of work on the new child tax credit, they can be investments, right? Like if we're making sure that families can invest in their children's education and making sure that they have food at night, I mean, those are things that can pay off over the long, like, pay off in terms of higher growth. And so it's not necessarily the case. And, and really for long-term investments, we might think deficit um, reduction isn't the highest priority, but we certainly have scope in the United States to think about like um, using uh, adjustments to tax equity. So having higher income taxes as a way to pay for other kinds of investments or the the guaranteed income that would be, you know, for the child tax credit, there were much more concentrated among people that had less less income. So there's a lot of ways to do it. So I do want to just jump in to briefly clarify a very important point that Claudia made regarding investments. So, you know, you anything that the government spends that is likely to, in the long run, increase growth from a fiscal perspective, that means that, uh, you know, there's going to be more taxes coming in. And so that means that, you know, we'll be able to pay it back from the returns to the investment in the future. So it's similar to how a company would invest into, you know, some productive asset that brings in income and then is able to pay back from that income. So that's very important that in general, it's a useful way to think about any spending that is investment like, you know, then, of course, you, you have to estimate likely future returns, you know, if your concern is to balance the books, but, you know, which is not quite the same for the federal government as it would be for a firm. But just in terms of understanding the, the concept, I think that's pretty critical uh, to, to think about it in those terms. Great. Claudia, anything else you wanted to add to that as well? I think 
that's good. All right, fantastic. Okay, next question. Uh, what does extrapolating smaller scale cash transfer programs like the Alaska Permanent Fund Dividend and those in American Rescue Plan to large scale guaranteed basic income plans suggest regarding price effects? So should I, this is kind of the whole topic of my slide. So is this a good moment to- Yeah, absolutely. That? All right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I prepared a bunch of slides with some useful, hopefully useful results. Okay, here. Um, all right, so this is uh, based on a current paper that uh, is about to come out uh, with Damon Jones uh, on universal cash transfers and inflation. And so, you know, the question is, yeah, like, so, you know, what would happen if those programs were made large scale? You know, what's the evidence? So, in fact, we don't have a lot of big cash transfers that are large scale, similar to a UBI in developed countries. But there are smaller things like, for example, SNAP, which are, is quasi cash and the impact on prices is a little unclear. What's more relevant for kind of scaling up um, is the randomized control trials, the experiments that have been done in a number of developing countries that you can really look at, uh, you know, the impact of this cash transfers on prices. And it's very important to note that in these experiments, the cash transfer was not financed. OK, so it, they didn't raise taxes or anything like that or had to have to decrease other expenditures. Instead, the cash came from outside from the experimenter. So it's similar to kind of a cash drop in those kinds of experiments. Right. So what they did is they randomized the cash across villages. So each village is like one economy. And that's how you can look at the impacts by comparing the villages that got a cash infusion to those that did. And the transfers varied from about 3% to as much as 27% of village level expenditure. So that's really a very large, you know, about a fourth of village expenditure that people would have received in cash. And so it's quite interesting to look at those results. They, again, randomized control trials, the gold standard for evidence. And we find, you know, they find that really these cash transfers have no effect on prices most of the time or even for the largest transfers, the effect is zero or a very, very small effect. And so how can you explain that? Well, uh, another important concept to keep in mind here is the idea of supply. So we call it elastic supply. So that means when you have greater cash circulation in villages as people receive all these uh, UBI style transfers, well, goods and services that are brought to market essentially must have increased enough to avoid an inflationary effect. So yeah, people had more money in their pockets. They were buying more stuff and the stuff came in. And so basically a uh, price increase uh, was um, avoided even in those villages that sometimes were somewhat isolated, uh, you know, in developing countries. Now we have looked specifically at the case of Alaska where in Alaska, right, uh, every year people receive uh, an amount of money that is roughly about maybe $1,000. It depends. It could be up to $2,000. And really, the payment is for everybody, including kids. The only condition is you have to have lived in Alaska for at least 12 months. So like in a high year, a family of five would be getting, you know, $10,000 with $2,000 uh, per person. Again, it varies from year to year. So on average, those dividends represent about 7.25% of total labor income in Alaska. So that's, you know, the share, right, of what people make by working in Alaska. So it's not a huge transfer. It's rather smaller as a share of the Alaskan economy than most of the transfers that were studied in the literature I just discussed from developing countries that tended to range more towards the 10 to 27%, um, you know, size of transfers. Therefore, we don't necessarily expect much effect on prices going into this study. So what we do is we get data on prices. And that was actually uh, very interesting. We were able to get detailed state level um, new data set on, on prices from Hazel et al. And we focus on the growth in the price index or, or inflation. And we're going to use a synthetic control method where we're going to select states that are most similar to Alaska in terms of both inflation and other characteristics before this Alaska Permanent Fund dividend payment started, which was in 1982. So essentially, those states are going to serve as control to tell us what would have happened if these transfers didn't start. And then we're going to compare inflation in Alaska 
versus this synthetic Alaska, which again is this control states, a weighted average of these control states after the dividend starts. And this is what you see, uh, which is uh, first the vertical line there is from 1982, and the uh, blue line is Alaska inflation, and the uh, you know red dotted line is synthetic Alaska. And so, you know, it's hard to distinguish if you look at this with the naked eye. It looks kind of similar, uh, you know, between Alaska and synthetic Alaska. But one thing I want you to notice is that before 1982, the two uh, groups, Alaska versus synthetic, are quite different. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, it was difficult to find a good control group for Alaska. You can see that synthetic Alaska had a much greater increase in inflation that came down much faster uh, during that very initial period uh, as compared uh, to Alaska. Then we look at these results in a table and we see that in column one, that's the average impact of the dividend on inflation that is again derived from comparing Alaska with the synthetic controls. And you see a positive effect, but it's not statistically significant. So it could just as well be a negative effect. You can see the 95% confidence interval includes uh, negative effects as well. Uh, and then, you know, if you look at non-tradables versus tradables, you know, there's nothing there either that's uh, significant. So to conclude, you know, we have very strong, you know, rigorous evidence from randomized control trials in developing countries that reveal that there are small to no price effects, even for transfers as large as 25% of the local economy that are not financed. Okay, they come from outside. In the US, we have the Alaska Permanent Fund, which is paid to all Alaskans since 1982. And we find some weak suggested evidence that the dividend might have a positive effect on inflation. But there's huge uncertainty about the true size of the effects. You've seen those confidence intervals were huge. And that's partly because in this case, it was very hard to find a good control group for Alaska because the period around 1982, right before, was a period of, uh, you know, rising and then rapidly falling inflation. So very unstable period. It's difficult to find a good control group during that period. So given that the transfer in Alaska was fairly small as a share of the economy, and given that prior estimates from this best, you know, gold star evidence in developing countries said that there was essentially no price effect, we expected going into this research to find at best a small price effect, maybe zero. And given our findings and the uncertainty that surrounds them, we conclude that there's not much reason to update our prior belief that there should be at best, you know, at worst, however you want to call it, very small uh, inflationary effects of UBI. So that's what I had for you. And we can go back to the discussion. All right. Thank you so much for that. Claudia, would you like to uh, add anything to that question at all? Uh would you like me to share my yeah, slides and do it? Because <laughs> it's they're related, but not it's not the Alaska, right? So let's see here. But it's the CTC, so oh, that'd be great. All right. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, so Joanna talked about the research and the Alaska of dividend fund. And what I have been working on is the, the new child tax credit. Um, I'm going to talk about the effects on inflation. I have a report with colleagues at the Jane Family Institute where we looked at the macroeconomic effects of the child tax credit. I mean, it was the child tax credit because it doesn't have a work requirement or a phase in. It's very similar to UBI for kids. I was told we're not allowed to, like, politically, that wasn't going to fly. But that's it. To me, that's a much better uh, than a tax credit. But it's, um, so we were doing it with the tax credit as an example. The results would apply. And there's a lot of research on guaranteed income. Frankly, a lot of the, when we think about longer term effects, it's much more on growth and labor force. I mean, inflation is something that's a temporary phenomenon, like when things start up. But, you know, it's important. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, this this is pretty brief. I just wanted to put some data out. So just at a high level, because the child tax credit was in the rescue plan, we had, you know, the monthly payments were from July until the end of the year. 
And the rescue plan has come over um, into a lot of the debate about it caused inflation or it didn't. And because the child tax credit was a part of it, it got wrapped up into that debate. And it was one, one of the reasons that was given say by Senator Manchin about not extending the child tax credit because it would push up inflation at exactly the time we were trying to bring it down. So the three points I'm going to make, and I'll show you just, a, you know, I do this with the facts, with the data I'm going to show you for each of these points. So first of all, the inflation that we have right now, a big part of it is related to supply disruptions caused by COVID whether it's getting stuff from halfway around the world here to people not being able to go back to work because they have to take care of their kids or they just fear dying. Uh, you know, so there was a lot that COVID did that made it hard, you know, to, it created a lot of imbalances between supply and demand. And just to state the obvious, the child tax credit does not affect supply, right? So it can't have caused that piece of, you know, contribute in that way. The second thing, the child tax credit, while it is in total almost a 1% of GDP, like somewhere in that range, um, it was a very small portion of the rescue plan. So if you think that was inflationary, you can't pin that one on the child tax credit. And it's a really small portion of aggregate income. Remember, inflation is this kind of aggregate phenomenon. And then finally, there's data that shows that parents, guardians, people, you know, that got the child tax credit, they only spent about half of it. And so that reduces even more how much of a boost to demand it is. Um, okay, just to have just a few charts here. So the first, this just shows you the inflation that we've had over time. And to the, the right end of the chart is obviously the most recent uh, period. And what you can see is, you know, a, a somewhere between a half or more of the inflation we've had is what we call supply driven. So that's like the shortages of the goods, like we don't have the used cars, the things that are pretty unusual and very clearly related to COVID. And now a lot of this is related to Putin. Um, it's the CTC could be in this part of the demand driven. Like if that's, that's the kind of inflation it could be causing, right? Um, and it's just important to know that a lot of what we're experiencing right now, it just doesn't like it's in a different place. Now, of course, people argue about this, but this is a decomposition from some uh, using some very good uh, statistical analysis. Okay, so the other thing is the child tax credit, I mean, it cut poverty in a major way. And I mean, it really was not that much money in the grand scheme of the aggregate economy, did a massive amount of good. Again, if you have complaints about the rescue plan, it's um, like, the child tax credit was a small portion of it. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of this relief was really good. And, you know, we can have debates about the stimulus checks. That's the big spike up. Um, but in terms of inflation, but I think it's just um, uh, borderline ludicrous that we're trying to pull the child tax credit into it. Um, the other thing, and this, uh, we talked before about uh, tax equity. Um, so this is taking total personal income so the aggregate number you know how much money is out there going to to households and what i've done here and there are tools at the bureau of economic analysis that let me do this is looking at every 10 percent of families by income how much of the total personal income do they have right and and then i added on the new child tax credit i mean there's basically no money that went above um, the 80th percentile, right? So it was the bottom 80% of families. And you can see, like, you can just barely see um, the child tax credit. So, you know, when we, again, inflation is an aggregate phenomenon. If we talk about, you know, quote unquote, excess demand right now, it's pretty clear who's got the money to be excessive. And it's not the families getting the, the child tax credit. Um, okay, and the last slide is, this is just showing you from a survey towards the end of last year, they asked families that got the child tax credit, what did you do with it? Um, I mean, if you look through this list, this is exactly what people who are advocates of the child tax credit would have wanted to see, food, housing, money on kids, right? Like that's, that's good. Um, and then almost half of it was um, saved or used to pay off debt. Right, like that's not boosting aggregate demand, particularly in a big jump that would cause inflation. So, 
I mean, there was a lot of good that was done with the child tax credit. And it looks like the costs, at least in terms of inflation, are very, very small. So, all right. Oops, did that. No, I love, personally, I love to see, like, you know, the people that are saving it. You know, I think that is one thing that can be such a stress reducer, right, for people of, like, knowing they have something, you know, for a rainy day, right? I mean, there's always rainy days that are going to come up, you know, flat tire, your car breaks down, you know, something that, you know, these like you know life events right that come up that mm -hmm. is really stressful when it's hard to save right you know you're trying to cover your bills every month it's really hard to build up a savings account so um for me personally i love seeing the savings aspect of it because i think from just from a mental health standpoint for people right knowing you have a little bit of a safety net is uh generally huge right mm -hmm. oh yona you're might be muted sorry I, I wonder if the saving effect might be bigger than usual because of the context that, that we are in. And, you know, I wonder if Claudia has any, you know, inkling on that. Because basically there were already all these checks and, you know, the economy is doing pretty good. So people were able to save perhaps more than usual. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty hard to make. There's so much different differences across families. One thing that's very um, unusual. Unusual, and I find it heartening, not everyone, not all my macroeconomist peers do, is the fact that they're like the bottom 50% of households built up wealth during this crisis in a way that you just you don't see any time um, in decades and decades, and particularly after the Great Recession, like it took them a very long time. And that's, I think, in the body, bottom 50%, like you have to, there's a lot of there was a lot of relief money that went out, you know, the stimulus checks, the child tax credit, the unemployment benefits, um, and that was able to help people. And then we've had a very strong and rapid recovery in the labor market, right? And so that's a lot of employment income. Now it's questionable, like how much people were able to spend, you know, because the economy was locked down. So it's really hard. Um, we're not going to have a randomized control trial for this one, um, but it is encouraging that you have families that have more of a buffer and that has been particularly helpful as inflation has been high and food and energy and housing, you know, so it's, it's there, the question, I mean, exactly who has it and why. I think for the higher income households, the, the case of, well, they just couldn't get out and spend as much as usual feels more likely than towards the bottom. Um, but I also wanted to add a twist to, to this with, about the distributional impacts that are so important because, you know, for lower income families, uh, you know, my, re my recent research actually shows that, you know, basically if you have low wages, it's hard to afford childcare. And for parents of young kids, they might not be able to work because of that constraint. And so having that extra cash for some, again, we're talking about heterogeneous effects, might have allowed them to work, you know, pay for some childcare and work in a way that, you know, they wouldn't have been able without that. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, a, it's another way that they can potentially leverage that to bolster their household income and their overall kind of economic mm -hmm. condition. Yeah, we could have a whole other discussion about work disincentives. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um. Trust me, I have plenty of friends that, you know, it's it's a push essentially, right? Like, you know, if they're going to pay for childcare, they're working just to pay for childcare or they could, you know, they're not making any more money, right? They're literally working just mm -hmm. for the paying for the childcare aspect of it. Um, you know, and I have a lot of friends that have just decided to, you know, have one of the members stay home, right? Just because mm -hmm. they'd rather, you know, if there's not going to be any advantage to working past, you know, paying for the childcare. I will say that in our earlier study of Alaska and the impact on work, we have some suggestive evidence that, you know, it's not particularly statistically strong for a number of reasons, but still it goes with the story that women in particular were actually more likely to work with this, you know, overall uh, transfer, join the labor force, usually part-time. So they went some, it seems, you know, it's consistent with some women went from not working to working part time, you know, because of this transfer, and that would very much mesh with the idea of mothers and childcare, you know, and having made that now being able to go out and work part time. Yeah, absolutely. You can't take away from the impact. I think people lose it sometimes. Well, it's, well, it's only two hundred and fifty dollars a month or three hundred dollars a month, but I mean that's life changing, right, for a lot of people. I mean that is, you know, I used to work in corporate America, you know, 
getting a 3% raise was the big thing, right? Like that's basically where you were at. I mean, getting an extra 300 a month, I mean, that really does, you know, change people's lives and like, you know, really how they can budget, you know, what they're able to do. So um, I'm a, personally a huge fan of the child tax credit. So um, great. So let's go on to the last question. And then we do have a couple questions from the audience. So um, Claudia, let's start with you on this one. Uh, what basic income policy design considerations do you think have the greatest impact on inflation? Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I think it's the um, the larger the program is, both in terms of the, the dollar amounts going to the families and the broader the eligibility, I mean, that's whatever effect there is scales up, right? So I think the big... Um, Well, and it's not just, I don't, um, see, it's hard for, like, my mental frame of thinking about child tax credit or guaranteed income, it is so hard for me to think about inflation as a top priority in evaluating, but I try here. Um, because it basically, you know, inflation comes because there's an imbalance between um, supply and demand, largely. I mean, there's some other factors, but, you know, and so giving people money, even if they don't spend it all, it gives them the opportunity to spend. And then it's there you can tell stories and like i i feel like there are stories you can tell with parents of young children that like would go in this direction that if if that policy that program helps you either now or down the road increase supply right like if more people go if you know mothers and fathers are able to go to work then they help produce stuff right so as long as you you keep this balance or um children or, or adults that can go get education and then down the road they can make investment you know i mean there's a way that these two balance the thing that makes it difficult um is and actually we learned this with the stimulus plan um it's much easier to get people in a place where they can spend like once you have the money you can spend right away this like building up the supply like investing in your skills and your chill like that stretches out over time. Frankly, that's the more important piece because that's our productivity, that's our long run growth. But like, good luck seeing that in the data, right? Whereas this like burst of, I gave people money and they'll spend. So so really, I mean, the, the biggest effect, I mean, and probably the phase in would make a difference too, like in terms of what you would see with inflation, but really it's as simple as how many dollars are we talking about? Like, because that's that's what's going to push up demand. Great. Uh, Yona, would you have anything you want to add to that question? I obviously completely agree. Like the size, you know, is going to be important. One way to, you know, reduce the, the size is to have it more targeted, which then offers other, you know, issues as, as, as always. Um, and but then the other thing is, as we discussed before, is how you fund it. So, you know, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, you know, if you're able to fund some of it, the more of it you can quote unquote fund by reducing other expenses or increasing taxes, the less likely that there will be an inflationary effect. And again, I'm not saying therefore you should fund it fully or whatever. I'm just saying directionally, the more funded it is, the less likely you're going to have an inflationary effect because then you're not, you're less likely to strongly increase aggregate demand, basically. So it's sort of for the same overall reason. Yeah, I mean, that's the, if you, right, because when you're funding it, you're raising taxes, right? We, we don't want to fund it by cutting programs. <laughs> um, so, but that means that whoever is paying those extra taxes, you're reducing their aggregate, their demand. Yes. Right? So if it balances that's out and you haven't changed demand. So I think that's one where any of these policies, we shouldn't consider them in isolation. Right. It's like a constellation of policies that, you know, if the goal is income security or invest, like thinking about big picture, what's the goal? And it's like, OK, what are the set of programs when we put together will maximize the benefits and reduce whatever costs there are? I think too much in policy discussions, we like hold up a program as a one off, um, you know, like as an example. Sorry for my uh, laser like focus on child tax credit but this came up before like if you give um parents the money 
and it, it leads some to put their kids in uh, childcare facilities so they can go work. People are like, oh, but you know, now you have, you've created um, excess demand for childcare facilities and the prices will go up and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, well, see, this is, there's a pretty straightforward solution here. Like you, you subsidize or help expand out childcare. Right. So the two together, like you can mitigate an effect. And instead of the, I think too often what happens with people who don't like the basic is they like point to, well, there's this effect. And so we shouldn't do it as opposed to, oh, there's a fact we should do it and do this other thing that mitigates the effect. Like there are ways to, you know, counter counterbalance and, and raising taxes is just one. Right. Because you could do things that increase supply where you think there's going to be extra demand. So great. Perfect. Well, we got about 10 minutes left. So I think we can start diving into some of the audience questions. We have a couple there. If we have enough time, I do have one question as I've been pitching in the basic income space since about 2019 um, when I was working on Andrew Yang's presidential campaign. So I've had many conversations with would-be voters and you know volunteers, et cetera. Um, so there is one question that definitely has come to the top more times than any, but Let's definitely dive into the audience questions here. Um, the first one is coming from Catherine Myers. Um, do you know any effort to count unpaid care in the analysts um, in the analysis of cost? So I'll repeat that. Do you know any? Uh, do you know of any effort to count unpaid care work in an analysis of cost? And I will pitch that to either of you who want to jump in. Well, as soon as you're talking about any kind of macroeconomic data inflation. I mean, the unpaid um, is nowhere in in that data, like at all. So I think the answer is, it's not captured. You want anything you'd like to add to that? Oh, okay, perfect. All right, I mean, uh, I should, uh, I should uh, say uh, there are studies, right? Like, it's not to say that there aren't researchers out there that think about this exact same question. It's just when we're in the space of kind of national accounts and GDP and inflation, it, it's not captured. So, Perfect. Thank you. And thank you, Catherine, for your question. Um, our next question comes from Alex Howlett. Um, can we prevent deflation using basic income instead of expansionary monetary policy? So... Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think one of the things that we learned in this crisis is giving money to people works pretty well at getting them to spend. Mm -hmm. Right. That's I know this is and, and it's clear, um, you know, the Federal Reserve, the one tool they have is moving interest rates around. A lower interest rate does not put more money in your pocket. Right. Like if you are capable, like it lowers a price, but it's a price that's kind of irrelevant to a lot of Americans. So, and we didn't have that kind of support from Congress in the recovery from the Great Recession, or just much, much less. So I think we've learned that if you want aggregate demand, whether you're in a recession and you want to blunt the recession, you want to speed the recovery, giving people money, guaranteed income is one way, does it. Um, same thing if you're I mean, a recession is probably where you might see deflation. I think the question for all of you who are interested in guaranteed income is there's a difference between sending out money like stimulus checks, like, you know, one year of a program versus a permanent program. Right. Deflation would be a, like in a recession problem, um, not like we want to do this always. Great. Thank you, Alex, for your question. All right. Our next question comes from Peter. Would you think that inflationary effects would be different when funding a UBI from income tax versus a VAT? Uh, <laughs> I'll let you have that one again. <laughs> well, I mean, so the VAT, right, it's like a proportional, uh, it's similar to a proportional tax on income. Not quite, but broadly, you can think about it that way. Uh, so, so that means that, you know, um, it's less progressive than the income tax. But still note, even a VAT takes more money from the rich because they spend more. So in terms of absolute dollars that are taken away, it's still the rich pay more into the system 
than the poor, even under a VAT that I'm going to approximate by saying like, whatever, imagine 5% on everybody's uh, income. So, you know, uh, and then realizing that the income tax is more progressive than the VAT, that's going to have a different impact into whose consumption is getting curtailed by the, you know, uh, raising those, those taxes and therefore financing it for an income tax would relatively speaking curtail the consumption of the high income individuals relatively more than financing it through a, a, a VAT, assuming the same budget for the whole thing, right? So, uh, and so then the question is for inflation, I guess then it would uh, depend on the marginal propensity to consume. So basically when you decrease somebody's income, how much less are they gonna consume, which fits directly into inflation and therefore at least classically, but uh, by the way, there's some reason, you know, okay, let me, let me track back. It's been believed that low income people have a ma higher marginal propensity to consume, but some recent evidence shows that that's not always the case. So I guess the classic response would be that the income tax is financing is more inflationary because you're taking away, uh, you know, kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, relatively speaking, you're uh, penalizing the poor less and the rich more so therefore the poor in net get a higher transfer and if they have a higher marginal propensity to consume it's more inflationary in that sense but it's not so clear anymore that there's such a huge difference between higher income and lower income individuals in their propensity to consume so maybe claudia can add more into that yeah no i agree with that. i mean i think the usually or the kind of uh, thinking now is that income is probably not the best predictor of how much people are, are likely to spend out of um, extra money. Right. Um, but, you know, having one thing that does seem to show up is people that have access to a, like easy access to a lot of funds, you know, like they have a lot of savings, they have things that they can easily kind of liquidate if they have a problem. Those tend to be lower MPC and there is a correlate. I mean, if you got a lot of income, you probably got a lot of savings set up. So it's kind of messy. And um, well, and at the end of the day, we aren't going to have a VAT here. So, you know, <laughs> I think you can, we can talk about it in theory, but that that's not going to, that's not going to happen. Well, you could do a sales tax. It's similar, worse, yeah. but similar. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Peter, for that question. Um, a bit of a follow up on that um, from Fred Weber. Any thoughts on funding UBI from wealth tax and what imp impact would that have on inflation? Mm -hmm. So here, the simplest anal analogy would be that you think that the wealth tax is also going to hit higher income people and disproportionately more so if that's the case. And then 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 that would be even more inflationary, quote unquote. And, and, and so again at the margin in comparison under that assumption and i just want to i'm realizing that maybe people aren't completely following what i'm saying is that you always have to consider the net meaning how much more taxes you're paying versus the the amount of the transfer you're getting and therefore uh, the more progressive the financing is and that means that on net the low-income people are getting more whereas if you spread it everybody chips in for this new benefit you know there's not as much relative benefit to the low-income people so Therefore, under the assumption that one, low income people tend to spend more and two, the wealth tax targets uh, uh, people with a lower marginal propensity to uh, consume or high income people, you might expect that it also similar to doing an income tax would have a, a bigger tendency to increase inflation. But this is highly uncertain because as Claudia said, there are some subtleties with who, you know, the MPC across groups. But isn't it also the case, I mean, with inflation, we're talking about aggregates, right? right? So rich people spend a lot more money, like a lot more money than um, poor people. So it's it's really like, have you... Yeah, but there are fewer of them. So it's, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I guess that's true. But still, <laughs> they spend a lot of money. <laughs> so. Well, this has been amazing. We have a, about a couple minutes left here. Um, I definitely want to thank both Yona and Claudia for coming in and basically teaching us all of these amazing things on the inflationary economic side. I think inflation is at the top of everyone's mind right now. Um, there are so many other questions about raising prices that I think you know a lot of people do have. Like, you know, wouldn't 
landlords start raising rent and wanting to just kind of level out like those sorts of things i would say for me that's the question i definitely get asked the most from people particularly people that are you know kind of skeptical about basic income and like what that would look like um so if you have any questions you know please put them in there we're going to be doing you know a session over this afternoon that some members will be in so definitely join us for that but i do want to thank you know you both for being panelists i want to thank everybody here for attending um please know a recording of this session will be available um, when this broadcast ends, um, you can use the same link you used to register um, to join the session. Um, again, if you'd like to continue the conversation, you can head over to Kumo Space um, during the lunch break to meet other conference attendees and speakers. Um, you can also join us this morning for our planner uh, session, Supporting Babies, Ending Child Poverty, with remarks from Representative Rashida Tlaib uh, to represent the details of the End Child Poverty Act. Uh, this session will discuss the arguments for and against targeting children for basic income policies. Um, we'll be announcing the winners of this year's high school essay contest as well. Um, but before that, uh, we have more sessions coming up, so please check out the conference website for details and schedule. Again, thank you both so much. Um, please check out Yona's podcast. Yona, if you'd like to plug your podcast. Yes, and also check your, out. Uh, Good. Just Sorry. economics, and thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> Great, and then please follow both of our uh, panelists on Twitter. Um, Yona, what is your Twitter handle? M Yona, M I O A N A. And, and Claudia? So mine's Cla the Claudia <laughs> underscore SOM. And I also have a Substack, stay at home macro Substack. And I write there a lot about the child tax credit and a lot about inflation. So if you want more, <laughs> that's great. Nice. Well, thank you so much. Let's, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of virtual applause going on. I know we're virtual and not in person, but generally this is where applause would happen. Um, very much appreciate it and great meeting you both. And really thank you so much yeah. and hope thank to see you, you all on uh, some more of these broadcasts throughout the day. Great. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.